Hello, my name is Alvin W. Barkley and I would like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. I was born on the 24th of November, 1877, in my grandfather Barkley's two-story log house in Wheel, Kentucky. Now, Wheel is not on very many maps today, but it's about halfway between Fancy Farm and Lowe's on the northwestern edge of Graves County. <laughs> in fact, some folks say that I entered this world squalling the old song Wagon Wheels. That's just a story. But it's a good one. And nobody loves a good story better than I do. A good story is like fine old Kentucky bourbon. It only improves with age. Now, I have a good story for you, and it's absolutely true. Albin W. Barkley was not my given name. No, sir. It was Willie A. Barkley. <laughs> That's right. My father with a solid sounding name John Wilson and my mother with the poetical Electra Eliza chose to name me Willie. Can you imagine a robust farm boy growing up in Western Kentucky as a Willie? And as politician, Willie couldn't have been elected assistant superintendent of the county poorhouse. No. As soon as I was old enough to assert myself I let it be known that henceforth my name would be Albin William Barclay. It has never been disputed. When I was 14 years old, my family moved to Clinton, Kentucky. Now, I will always believe that fate played a hand in that move. You see, Clinton was home to Marvin College and its excellent liberal arts program. And while I was keenly interested in furthering my education, there was one huge problem. I had no money. Fortunately, I received one of the college's two annual scholarships. I rang the school bell, dusted and swept the buildings, kept the fires going, hauled water, and generally did whatever my janitorial scholarship specified. Years later, after I'd received a modicum of fame, I am told that a sign was placed on the side of the building proclaiming that Barclay swept here. <laughs> While it may not sound like very much today, the job of janitor was a coveted position. I wrangled the scholarship from one of the school's two co-presidents, Mr. J.C. Spate. When I became United States Congressman, I was able to repay Mr. Spate. I nominated his son for admission to the United States Naval Academy, and I'm told the young man went on to become a very fine naval officer. But his father, as far as most folks around Clinton were concerned, committed an act tantamount to treason. He helped elect William J. DeBow of Crittenden County, the first Republican senator in the history of the Commonwealth. Now, a lot of folks think that what Mr. Spate did reminded them of the story about a young fellow who wrote a letter to his newspaper's advice to the Lovelorn editor. In it, he confided, I have met a lovely young girl of fine character, and I want to marry her. She already knows about my sister, who is a prostitute, my brother in the penitentiary, and my uncle in the insane asylum but she doesn't know that I have two cousins who are Republicans. Shall I tell her? <laughs> when I completed my studies at Marvin in 1897, I wanted two things from life, to become a lawyer and to go into politics. I attended Oxford, Georgia's Emory College for one year on borrowed money, and when that ran out, I returned to Clinton to teach at my alma mater. However, by this time, my father, who had been struggling mightily on the farm for years, finally decided to give it up. He went to Paducah to work in the cotton cordage mill. So at the end of that semester, I packed all my belongings into one suitcase and with 50 cents in my pocket, joined my family in Paducah. It was the beginning of a new era for the entire family. Going home would never again mean going back to the farm. From that day on, I have called Paducah home. 
Now, I've run many races in my life of various kinds, but I never ran any harder than I did in Paducah those first few years trying to read enough law to pass the bar exam before I starved to death. I clerked without pay in the law offices of J. Charles K. Wheeler merely for the privilege of reading his extensive law library. For real money, I worked odd jobs, including clerking in Jim Rudy's shoe store. One day, a man with the biggest feet I'd ever seen came into the store and said to me, I'd like to see a pair of shoes that would fit me. I replied, Mr. So would I. Later, Mr. Rudy and I agreed that my future lay elsewhere. In 1901, after reading law more than two years, I passed the bar exam and hung out my shingle. I want you to know, however, those first few years in Paducah weren't all spent reading law. I was also courting a young lady named Dorothy Brower. When Dorothy moved to Tiptonville, Tennessee, I immediately began making plans to get her back on a, well, more permanent basis. I figured the best way to accomplish that would be to marry the girl. So when I proposed and she said yes, that is precisely what I did. Now, a die-hard rumor has circulated for years that I rode onto the McCracken County political scene astride a mule named Jude. That is simply not true. It was a one-eyed horse named Dick. The point is, it doesn't matter what I rode. I was in a political campaign, and I took it directly to the people. Where six or more were gathered together, I made a speech. I traveled throughout the countryside and bivouacked wherever nightfall found me. I was a statesman, philosopher, humorist, diplomat, and psychiatrist. And when folks spread a dinner on the ground, I could eat 22 feet of a 100-foot spread. Now, that wasn't gluttony. It was just smart politics. Why, to turn down even one slice of Mark Krusty's prize apple pie would be tragic. It could cost me not only her vote, but valuable credibility within her sphere of influence as well. Anyhow, I won that election, and on the first Monday in January, 1906, I became the prosecuting attorney of McCracken County. That was my first political office. Four years later, using many of the same strategies, I won the seat for McCracken County Judge. In 1912, with two political victories under my belt, not to mention a fair amount of apple pie, I was ready to jump into a bigger arena, Kentucky's first congressional district, and a race for the seat in the United States House of Representatives. Now, by this time, Dorothy and I had three children, David, Marion, and Laura Louise. So you see, winning elections was no longer merely a personal ambition. It was a family responsibility. Three other men jumped into that Democratic primary, including one of my early Paducah mentors, Colonel John Hendrick. During the campaign, he enjoyed characterizing me with Shakespearean flair as a dangerously ambitious young man. Well, I turned his daggers by telling my audiences, Colonel Hendrick will run for anything not nailed down or locked up. Why, when the Pope died some years ago, nobody would tell Hendrick for fear that he would declare for that office. My campaign speeches included progressive ideas, such as federal aid for roads, prompting Hendrick and others to label me a socialist. Well, I simply agreed with Abraham Lincoln. The purpose of government is to do for the people what they cannot do for themselves or do so well. Well, sir, I won that election. And in 1913, this old farm boy from Wheel, Kentucky, traveled to our nation's capital to take his seat in the 63rd Congress of the United States. In fact, in my entire life, I have engaged in only two unsuccessful campaigns. As a young lawyer in Paducah, I ran for the office of exalted ruler of the benevolent and protective order of Elks. <laughs> I lost. Years later, as a man of some maturity, I ran for the governorship of this great commonwealth and lost. Now, I never wanted to be an exalted ruler, so I won't dwell on that. And though I had no particular ambition to be governor either, 
I do have a few things to say about that race. It was 1923, and although I was suffering under the Republican administration of Warren G. Harding, I was still happy with my job. But when some of my loyal supporters started urging me to run for governor, well, I must admit, I was pretty easily persuaded. I entered the Democratic primary against J. Campbell Cantrell of Scott County. It was a tough campaign. I became known as the Iron Man, often making as many as 16 speeches a day. My campaign orations, orations included some harsh words against paramutual gambling. I asked my audiences, if it is immoral to shoot dice, or to play poker, or to roll a roulette wheel, what is it that sanctifies a racetrack? Also, I suggested a production tax on coal. Now, in a state known for horses and coal, this didn't sit well with a lot of people. It gave considerable swell to Cantrell's campaign treasure chest. And while I won the western half of the state, he won the eastern half, and along with it, the election. I returned to Washington in 1926 and waged a successful campaign for one of Kentucky's two seats in the United States Senate. A good bit of the noise during those roaring 20s came from the grand old party. You see, the Republicans had roared into the White House in 1921 and didn't give it up until Franklin Roosevelt crashed the party in 1933. Roosevelt defeated Herbert Hoover, whose administration had been seriously blighted by the Great Depression. To his credit, Hoover tried to curtail the Depression. That is, once he realized we were having one. But it was far too little and far too late. His belated efforts reminded me of the country boy who rushed to a neighbor's house at mealtime to announce that his wagon load of hay had just turned over. When the neighbor insisted that the boy calm down and have something to eat, the boy frantically persisted that his pappy wouldn't like it. Finally, the neighbor won the argument, and the boy sat down and enjoyed a very good meal. Upon finishing, he got up to leave and said, thanks for the meal, but I still think pappy won't like it. Well, by this time, somewhat exasperated, the neighbor replied, what makes you so sure your pappy won't like it? Well, the boy replied, Pappy's under the hay. As a senior citizen and later as a senior senator and later as majority leader, I worked very closely with President Roosevelt in passing much of his New Deal legislation. We enjoyed a very cordial relationship. On one occasion, FDR even speculated on the possibility that I might succeed him in office. Later, however, we had a very serious difference of opinion. It created a temporary rift between us that many believe cost me the presidency. You see, it was February 1944. We were in the midst of World War II. Congress had worked very hard on passing legislation to increase taxes to fund the war effort. Well, Roosevelt thought the increase to be inadequate. His veto message, read before both houses of Congress, not only vetoed the bill, but question the motives and integrity of the entire Congress. Well, sir, I was infuriated. I went on the floor of the Senate and made an impassioned speech challenging Congress to pass the bill over the president's veto. They did, and I was in the presidential doghouse. When reporters asked me about the speech, I told them I felt like the young Swede who had proposed marriage to his girlfriend while driving down the road. She immediately said yes, and he fell into a stony silence that continued on for several minutes. After the silence had become uncomfortable, the girl asked him, well, why don't you say something? He replied, I think I say too much already. At the convention that year, Harry Truman was chosen as FDR's running mate, and when Roosevelt died the following year, it was Truman, of course, who became the 33rd president of the United States. Many believe this old farm boy missed the wagon due to the disagreement over that one piece of tax legislation. But I don't want to leave you with a wrong impression. 
I have no bitterness about the fact that I never became president. I am very proud of my record as public servant and legislator, fighting for programs that stand today as the very bedrock of the American home. The Tennessee Valley Authority, the Rural Electrification Administration, and Social Security, just to name a few. I know what it's like to grow up on a farm without electricity. It can be a dark and lonely experience. The TVA and REA have brought light to homes and lightened the workload of much of rural America. Almost every American will, at one time or another, reap the benefits of Social Security. These programs, programs that some folks take for granted, had to be fought for, and that battle went all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, I never doubted their validity. The Constitution is not an object of curiosity merely to be pl placed on the shelf of some museum. It is a life-giving charter. Following a long illness, my beloved wife Dorothy died in 1947. We had been married 44 years, <laughs> but it wasn't long before the society columnists started marrying me off to every eligible widow in the country. But marriage was not on my agenda. In 1948, I finally got the number two spot on the Democratic ticket as Truman's running mate. Now, Harry and I were underdogs in that race against a couple of very popular Republican governors, Thomas Dewey and Earl Warren. But we refused to roll over and die. Harry waged his whistle-stop campaign from the rear of a train and gave him hell while I waged the first prop stop campaign in national political history in a chartered airplane I dubbed the Bluegrass. I went to 36 of the 48 states, traveled some 150,000 miles, and gave over 250 speeches. Not bad for a man some had already begun to label as too old, especially when you consider that my speeches were often as noteworthy for their length as for their content. Harry Truman declared that my speeches had no terminal facilities. His favorite example was the story I told about a speech I gave in Ashland, Kentucky. Now my time was limited because I had to catch a train, so I put my watch on the rostrum that I might consult it periodically. After speaking for some length, I looked at the watch, picked it up, shook it, and held it to my ear. At this point, some fellow that Truman always referred to as that wild hillbilly Kentuckian stood up and shouted, Senator, there's a calendar behind you. Against all odds, or so they said at the time, we defeated the Republican ticket. A whole lot of people had to eat a whole lot of crow after that election. The folks at the Chicago Tribune must have found the headline, Dewey Defeats Truman to be most indigestible. On the 20th of January, 1949, I was sworn in as the 35th Vice President of the United States. The oath was administered by fellow Kentuckian Justice Stanley F. Reed of Mason County, and I placed my hand on a Bible presented to me by the Broadway Methodist Church of Paducah. I had been Veep for only about six months, when my life took an abrupt and unexpected change. I attended a party on board the presidential yacht Sequoia and met a widow from St. Louis named Jane Hadley. Well, this old country boy once again fell hopelessly in love. Just four months and ten days later, I became the first vice president in history to be married while in office. When my term as vice president ended in 1953, Jane and I retired to Angles, our home in Paducah. I took up domestic chores, wrote my memoirs, even did a little TV, a program for NBC called Meet the Veep. And while that was all well and good, I missed my work, and I missed my real home, the floor of the United States Senate. After a little more than a year of retirement, I challenged Senator John Sherman Cooper for his seat. And while I won the election, I had lost my seniority. 
and was forced to resume my career in Congress as a junior senator. Oh, I've, I've got to watch the time. Jane and I are leaving shortly for Lexington, Virginia. The students at Washington and Lee University are having a mock convention and have graciously invited me to deliver the keynote address. Say, I'll tell you what, if you'll permit me, I'd like to give you a little sample of that speech. I'll do my favorite part about being a junior senator. It comes right near the end. Here now. Oh, here we go. I have served my country and my people for half a century as a Democrat. I went to the House of Representatives in 1913 and served 14 years. I was a junior congressman. Then I became a senior congressman. And then went to the Senate and became a junior senator. And then I became a senior senator and then Majority Leader of the Senate, and then Vice President of the United States. And now I am back again as a junior senator. I am willing to be junior. I am glad to sit on the back row, for I would rather be a servant in the house of the Lord than to sit in the seat of the mighty. Well, what do you think? Maybe they'll nominate me for president? I'll be ready. Honestly, I don't object to being a junior senator. I still have plenty of time to climb back up that old political ladder. When I was in Egypt back in 1948, an old Arab fortune teller for the bargain sum of $2.50 predicted that I would live to be 100 years old. Then for another two fifty, he raised it to 105. So you see, I'm just getting started. Maybe I'll go back and do the whole thing over again. Wouldn't that be something? Well, thank you very much. And goodbye.